Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Ottawa has handed out hundreds of billions of dollars in pandemic relief, and it isn't over yet. So where did that money go? CBC News digs in and finds out from help for individual Canadians. I had to lay off pretty much everybody. To airlines, to procuring truckloads of PPE. There's been a lot of opportunistic organizations that uh, don't have any experience. Our investigative series, The Big Spend, starts tonight. A plea from staff in Ontario nursing homes. We are desperately in need of help. The challenge of making things better in time to make a difference. It's really hard to staff up homes literally in a war zone. People the Taking a live online performance to the next level, Jill Barber tells us about her new project. I was really pleased to create an event online that was meant to be online. This is The National. We begin with a CBC News investigation into eight months of pandemic spending by the federal government. $240 billion between mid-March and the end of November. An unprecedented number in these unprecedented times. But where exactly did it go? CBC News searched through federal documents, financial reports, and access to information requests in a project we're calling The Big Spend. I'm announcing that the government will provide $100 million, $2,000 a month, $962 million, $9 billion. Just days after the pandemic was declared back in March, money started pouring out of Ottawa. In update after update, the Prime Minister announced billions in spending through dozens of new programs and measures to calm financial fears and keep Canadians afloat. We are launching the Canada Emergency Business Account, the new Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. CBC News has calculated the total price tag at $240 billion so far. Of that, more than $105 billion went to individuals, most of it distributed through the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. More than $81 billion to 8.9 million people. That's a third of all adults in this country. Businesses, nonprofits, and charities got more than $118 billion. Most of that in wage subsidies and business loans. The remaining $16 billion and change went to government departments and agencies. The federal government has offered up the big picture of where that money went, but few specifics about who got the cash and how much. It's important for Parliament to know how that money is flowing. Former Parliamentary Budget Officer Kevin Page says it's not too late to increase transparency. If we find ourselves in another pandemic, we want to know what are the best programs um, that really helped out vulnerable people, that kept businesses solvent. When much of Canada locked down in the spring, millions of people suddenly found themselves out of work. Many were able to weave together a survival plan out of a patchwork of programs created by the federal government. David Cochran with How It Worked for One Montreal Family and the Family Business. As a custom bra fitter, Debbie Donnell is used to offering other people support. But she found herself needing some when the pandemic forced her business to close. I was worried mostly at that time financially for my, for my staff, my employees. Months later, she's still worried, but still here. Kept afloat by a life raft of government aid. Whew. Um, I don't think I would be open right now, honestly. When the first wave hit, Canada shut down and millions of businesses closed overnight. They had to scramble to get help and sign up for a rolling tide of new programs. For Danelle, government-backed credit lines helped cover costs and meet payroll. That lasted about three weeks before Danelle had to make tough decisions. So I had at that time uh, eight employees and at that time I had to lay off pretty much everybody, so seven of them. One of those seven was her own daughter, Kira. I mean, it was expected because I had got notification that we were closing and I wasn't super surprised by it. Check on the website. But Danelle knew she could make that choice because Kira and the others could go on CERB. $2,000 every month uh, for the next four months so that we can get through this together. I also claim CERB for that first period as well, just because I actually needed the money for the business more than myself personally. 
Yeah, that could be a bug. With credit lines and the SER putting a floor beneath them, Kira and her dad, Ken, work to transition mom's business for online sales. Eventually, the wage subsidy allowed Danell to hire back Kira and another employee. Then the rent subsidy helped cover her fixed costs. From Seba to Serb to Suze to Sarah, they've survived because of this alphabet soup of government programs and the loyalty of their customers. Between them and the government and my amazing staff who are still here, we're, we're, doing, we're doing pretty good, okay. Considering the alternatives, okay, is pretty great. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Let's bring in Diana Swain, CBC News Senior Investigative Editor. And Diana, what prompted you and your team to dig into these numbers? Really, Ian, it was the sheer volume of the spending that we all witnessed. We found the government moved money through more than 100 different programs or funds over these past several months. In fact, we worked it out to roughly $40 million an hour since March just on money connected to the pandemic. In fact, the federal government has transferred money either by check or by direct deposit to individuals, businesses, organizations at an average of more than 10 million times a month. And no one disputes that the government needed to get money out the door and to do it quickly. But nearly nine months into this now, we went looking for some specifics. So you were searching for an accounting of all this money. What did you find? Well, Ottawa is transparent about the high level numbers of program spending, but there are some real gaps in that transparency when you drill down. For instance, which businesses have gotten those billions in payroll support and how much did they get? That is not public. The U.S., by contrast, puts all of that information right on its website. And the answers are really critical to knowing if the money was spent properly. And we've spent weeks now combing through public documents, financial filings, to get a clearer picture of just where the money is gone. And, and later tonight and in the days ahead, we'll be showing examples of instances where the money worked as intended and examples of where that is not quite so clear. Thanks, Diana. And so later in the show, we'll look at the billions of your dollars spent to procure personal protective equipment, plus which publicly traded company seems to have received the most government help. Now to the latest on COVID-19. In many provinces, the signs continue to point not to relief, but to rising pressure. In Ontario, another COVID-19 record. 1,924 new cases reported today. That breaks the record set just yesterday. Ontario may test more than twice as much as other provinces, its positivity rate much lower than the country as a whole, but the province leads Canada for the number of outbreaks in long-term care. As Talia Ricci reminds us, the toll there is high. Long-term care staff in Hamilton this weekend say they don't know how much more they can take. It's nerve-wracking every day going in and, and having to deal with everything. As case counts continue to break records, more than 100 long-term care homes are facing outbreaks. One home so overwhelmed, a housekeeper is handling the dead. Oh, I see a lot because I help out wherever help is needed. So I'll go get the gurney, go up and get the deceased and then bring them down and outside to the funeral home. This second wave is going to be a long, slow march with sadly maybe an equal number of deaths of what we saw in the first wave. Here at Westside Long-Term Care Home in Toronto, there are 81 residents and 50 staff members with active cases of COVID-19. Revira, which runs the home, had volunteer experts conduct an internal review set to be released tomorrow. To protect residents, those experts are recommending widespread daily testing. If they are not being tested, the risk of them unknowingly bringing disease into the home during a time when they're infected but asymptomatic is, it, you know, it's high. The federal government promised a billion dollars to improve infection control in Canada's long-term care homes. But that comes over the next three years. This expert says the issue now is staffing and Ontario needed to start hiring months ago. Sure, they have access to PPE, but when you don't even have the staff, it's like going into a battle without any of the soldiers available. So, so this is really what our big shortcoming has been. And it's really hard to staff up homes and attract people to come into work, literally in a war zone. It's a revolving door of ambulances coming with people being shipped out. And for those battling the virus now, reinforcements can't come soon enough. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto.
Quebec no longer leads the country in newly reported COVID cases, but for anyone hoping for a turnaround, this has been a challenging weekend. Today, 1,691 new cases after Saturday's total of more than 2,000. Quebec has led the country in COVID hospitalizations throughout the pandemic. With case rates trending up again, Valeria Cory Minocchio shows us the message from medical staff that they just can't keep up. These nurses may not be throwing in the towel, but they're hanging up their scrubs to say they've hit a breaking point. She says people leave crying, they're unable to keep working, people are completely exhausted. With COVID cases and hospitalizations rising, they say so is the stress of being on the front lines. The workload on the healthcare professional is at its maximum right now. Every day we have uh, some of them that are falling sick, getting COVID-19, or just leave the system. That was their message in front of this hospital on Montreal's West Island. Some of its units have COVID outbreaks. Just today, officials asked people to avoid the emergency room that's now at full capacity. Experts echo the concerns on the front lines. The system is starting to show cracks, uh, the healthcare system, and now is really the time to act. Because if we don't do anything within the next two weeks, we're going to get to the point where the only thing we'll be able to do is go back to a full and complete lockdown like we had to in wave one. Dr. Shepard says the focus now should be on deploying rapid testing. 40% of the outbreaks that we're seeing in Quebec are in the workplace. Deploying rapid tests that can diagnose a contagious person in less than 15 minutes is the best way to remove the symptom these asymptomatic individuals from the workplace and break the chain of transmission. For these nurses, what's critical now is that Quebecers keep following public health guidelines and avoid gathering in red zones especially during the holidays. We will not be able to continue like that. Another surge, they warn, could break the system. Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal. That's a stark look into one region experiencing this rise of COVID-19 cases across the country. Now let's bring in infectious disease physician Zane Chagla to talk more about this. And Dr. Chagla, in some places in Canada, certainly southern Ontario, the usual hot spots like restaurants, gyms and malls had been shut down. And yet we're still seeing numbers rise. Where is the transmission still happening? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a good argument that this is all not just these public facing establishments. There certainly is transmission there and, and shutting them down has at least helped dampen that a bit. But we're also seeing essential workplaces with transmission. We're seeing other workplaces like uh, medical facilities with transmission. And then finally, we're seeing transmission in people's homes. And unfortunately, no set of restrictions is going to necessarily police that. And so if you could get word out to the people who are watching now across the country, what is it that, that we have to do right now to try to break these chains of transmission? Yeah, I, I, four things. One is, uh, you know, reducing indoor gatherings as much as possible, keeping it to the people in your household. Number two being those people who do need to go to work and support us. Mask while you're indoors. Be careful where you take your breaks. Don't go to work while sick. Number three, everyone needs to get tested if they're developing symptoms. Public health needs to contact trace and, and case isolate. And number four, we need to communicate to others and, and in our own circles to follow the above three rules in order to keep things down. Really good advice, Dr. Chagla. Thank you. No problem. Let's turn now to the worsening situation in Alberta, where new daily infections have been moving toward the 2,000 mark for four straight days. Today, the count of 1,836 down slightly from yesterday's record high. It's hard, though, to overstate how serious things are. Alberta has Canada's highest infection rate and the highest number of active cases with almost 19,000. Not long ago, Manitoba had Canada's highest COVID infection rate. Daily case counts have roughly stabilized in the 300 range for the past week or so, but in the northern Shamatawa First Nation, leaders are now requesting military assistance to prevent disaster. Erin Broman tracks a desperate situation. Two weeks ago, there were two cases. Today, nearly 200. Some isolating at home, some in the school gym. Others outside of the remote flying community of just over 1,000. 
the fear is, you know, it's, it's a confined space. Uh, with the overcrowding, uh, a lot of our elders are testing positive, which is, which is really, really concerning. Chief Redhead asked for government help and the elders to be flown out weeks ago. It took over a week for the pandemic team to arrive. Um, I knew this was going to blow up because of the overcrowding in the homes. It was, you know, it was just a matter of time. And, and look where we are now. It's, it's really, really concerning. Two small teams are on site doing testing and tracing, but some members have tested positive and are now isolating themselves. The Canadian Armed Forces is sending six rangers to assess the situation, but the chief wants full military service. We've been requesting medical personnel from the military, their nurses, their doctors, to help with contact tracing, to help with testing. Uh, we're requesting their, their temporary structure so that members can safely isolate. Catherine Redhead, originally from Shimadawa, has sick family members there, including an 81-year-old aunt. And she's taking care of a one-year-old child, and the baby too has COVID-19, and they were flown from Shimadawa to Winnipeg. I'm so worried. MP Nikki Ashton is also calling on Ottawa to send more help as soon as possible. This is a time for urgent action, and it is about saving lives. Meanwhile, fear is spreading as fast as the virus. I'm scared for our elders. You know, it's, it's, I have a family here too. And, and I'm worried that because, you know, I'm on the ground with them, that I'm going to bring it home and, and you know, God forbid that happens. Chief Redhead has now called for a field hospital as more get sick. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. An outbreak of COVID-19 has been declared at a mink farm in BC's Fraser Valley. According to health authorities, eight people at the farm have tested positive. It's not clear if any mink are infected, but millions of mink were culled in Denmark after a mutated strain of the virus was found in the animals that had jumped back to humans. BC officials are working with the farm to contain the outbreak. And there's another concerning situation in BC's Fraser Valley. Three churches are refusing to obey public health orders banning religious services. Briar Stewart looks at the growing tension between defiant worshippers and frustrated local residents concerned about safety. Besides the masks, it appeared to be a typical Sunday at two Chilliwack churches, which are still holding in-person services, despite a provincial health order that's been in place for more than two weeks. We pray that you would give wisdom to our civil authorities. It was blatant non-compliance. Julie Connolly lives across the street from one of the churches. I think it's irresponsible and I think it's selfish. Uh, I think that there's more to, uh, more to their faith than uh, just worshipping within the confines of that building. In nearby Langley, RCMP fined this church $2,300 last week, but today bylaw officers looked on while 50 gathered. Amen. Lord bless you guys. You may have a seat. It was open for three services. No one directly affiliated with these churches would speak with us. However, a few turned up to show their support. Some of them saw this as a charter of rights issue, while others were against masks. There's no pandemic. You know, we have a personal responsibility for ourselves and then everyone else can do the same. The church in Langley says it's consulting a lawyer and plans to take the case to court. But in Manitoba, a judge ruled against Winnipeg's Springs Church which wanted to have drive-through services. Each court's entitled to its opinion, and, and those opinions can uh, be challenged and appealed. Back in Chilliwack, Lindsay Britton called the police last Sunday and again today. The police didn't turn up this morning, but in a statement, investigators said they're looking into a small number of congregations that are continuing to hold services. I'm not worried about them having their services in there. What concerns me is that where they go tomorrow. He says when people who gathered together in church later congregate in stores and businesses in the community. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Chilliwack. Canada is well positioned to approve one of the most promising vaccines soon. That's according to an executive with BioNTech, the German company that partnered with Pfizer to develop its shot. And today on Rosie Barton Live, he said once approved, it could be delivered to Canada quickly. So if I use the UK as an example, uh, we got approval at 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we approved uh, releases of vaccine and shipped it within 24 hours. 
On Tuesday, Britain is set to become the first country in the world to start inoculations. Initially, the vaccine will be available at hospitals before stocks are distributed to doctors' clinics. The U.S. is also anticipating rollout of a vaccine in the next few days, but officials there are warning people not to let their guard down as the number of confirmed infections keeps going up. Today, there were at least 181,000 new cases. The U.S. has added more than 1.2 million cases since the beginning of December. One of those is another member of Donald Trump's inner circle, his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. And as Susan Ormiston explains, he could have exposed hundreds. This was Thursday in Atlanta. No mask, no distancing, disregarding public health advice. Imagine Trump supporter Bill White here wondering if this hug with Rudy was worth it. There it is. Or the selfie. Or the meet and greets with hundreds of people Rudy Giuliani has been close to in the last week, mostly maskless. <laughs> Networks don't get to decide elections. Courts do. The president's lawyer and chief defender has been popping up at multiple hearings in at least four states, spreading claims about rigged elections and maybe something more. Trump broke the news late today, saying his friend tested positive using the pejorative China virus. Get better soon, Rudy. We'll carry on. Before his turn with Trump, Giuliani was best known as the mayor of New York at the time of the 9-11 attacks. He's 76 and today was admitted to Georgetown University Hospital in Washington in the same week which saw over one million new COVID-19 cases in the U.S. It's not so surprising perhaps that he got COVID, it's that it took this long. His son tested positive two weeks ago as Giuliani sweated his way through a packed news conference. Did you all watch my cousin Vinny? Loyal and unswerving, he has been tirelessly propping up Trump's presidency. They are the ones who have the Up until this morning, on Fox News, where he appeared healthy, speaking to the millions of Americans who still believe this election was stolen, which is unproven in any court so far. It's a disturbing pattern. More than 40 in Trump's inner circle have now contracted the virus. And the pandemic spread is worse now than it was in the spring. The CDC recently urged all Americans to wear masks indoors. It's obvious some are disregarding that advice. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump was in Georgia to rally support ahead of next month's crucial Senate runoffs. Are you going to vote in the runoff election? Not in the current system. Why would I? Up next, how Trump's message may be backfiring with some supporters. We're on the ground in Georgia. Plus, tracking the federal government's pandemic spending. From airlines to PPE, we break down the numbers in a CBC News investigation. Keep all the and later, turning to the past to create performances of the future. I was really pleased to create an event online that was meant to be online. A new model for live entertainment. We'll be right back. All the stories you want. How much? How much? Zero. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. Donald Trump's quest for revenge at the polls has taken him to Georgia. He was campaigning for two Republican Senate candidates while continuing to rail against the electoral system. But as Katie Simpson shows us, some Republicans worry that could backfire. The fight isn't over for the faithful, even if the facts are not on their side. There is no doubt about the election. He won the election. We know he won. In this sea of red hats and many maskless faces, there's a deep sense an injustice has taken place. Many here believe the president's unsubstantiated claims of widespread voter fraud. We know that all that election stuff was a bunch of bull. It was all a bunch of lies from the Democrat and all that corruption is going to be exposed. Republicans worry Donald Trump's claims are disenfranchising voters. They fear his supporters won't participate in Georgia's Senate runoff election races next month because they don't see a point if the system is rigged. They're very disillusioned with our process. It's been a joke. It has been a joke. 
The president's repeated claims about voter fraud have certainly resonated with this crowd, but most people we spoke with say they still plan to vote in the Senate runoff election. Even if we don't trust the system, we still have to interact with what we have, and what we have is way better than not voting. I plan to vote. Whether the election's rigged or not, that doesn't mean that I can't try to make a stand to make sure my voice is heard. This was stolen from him. Lauren not Voiles that, is the exception the Republicans the worry about. Are you going to vote in the runoff election? Not in the current system. Why would I? We've never lost an election. We're winning this election. While Trump mostly focused on his own woes, he urged voters like Voiles to show up. We can fight for the presidency and fight to elect our two great senators, and we can do it at the same time. This is what Georgia's Republican Senate candidates needed, a direct message to rally the troops. Thank you, Georgia. Get out and vote. Get out and vote. And if the energy at the end of the night is any indication, Trump may have done just that. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Valdosta, Georgia. An American study blames targeted microwaves for injuring the country's diplomatic staff in Cuba and China. Dozens of U.S. and Canadian staff and their families suffered nausea and headaches between 2016 and 2018. But while the investigation found what made them sick, it didn't say where it came from. Five Canadian diplomats and their families are suing Ottawa for $28 million, saying the federal government failed to protect them. Cameron Ortis was once the RCMP's top intelligence official. Now he's behind bars facing charges of revealing secrets to some of the very individuals the RCMP was supposed to be investigating. How did the RCMP get their man and what led them there in the first place? Bob McEwen previews this Fifth Estate investigation. Two Canadians with brilliant high-tech minds. Cameron Ortis was the RCMP's senior intelligence official. There was no person on earth who had the better talent base than Cameron to lead that kind of work. I'm Vince Ramos. I'm from uh, Vancouver, B.C. Vincent Ramos and his company Phantom Secure cornered the international market for encrypted cell phones. It sells encrypted phones that are so secure even Australia's electronic spy agency can't crack their code. What Cameron was seeing all the way through that period was some of the darker sides of the internet, how it was used by organized crime. Now his RCMP job was to stop that. Meanwhile, Vincent Ramos was getting rich from drug traffickers and biker gangs. I think he, he probably started out his business maybe with better intentions, but I think it became clear pretty quickly that the people who were drawn to his product were criminal organizations, there were drug cartels. I need that evidence gone ASAP. Soon there was an undercover RCMP investigation into phantom secure phones. But the thing is, the cops can't access it, right? Then, this. It came out of the blue, an email to cell phone CEO Vincent Ramos in Vancouver, offering official secrets, including information from an active RCMP investigation into none other than Vincent Ramos himself. According to documents seen by the Fifth Estate, RCMP investigators determined the sender of that email was their own intelligence chief, Cameron Ortis. Cameron Ortis has now been in custody for over a year, awaiting trial for revealing secrets and plotting to leak more. Yeah. Vincent Ramos pleaded guilty in the U.S. to racketeering for selling encrypted phones to criminals. He got nine years in U.S. federal prison and forfeited $80 million. Once on opposite sides of the law, today Ortis and Ramos are both behind bars. Cameron Ortis's trial is expected sometime next year. Bob McEwen, CBC News, Toronto. For the full investigation into Cameron Ortis and all the twists and turns, tune into the Fifth Estate Monday night at 9 p.m., 9.30 in Newfoundland. When we come back, more from our CBC News investigative series, The Big Spend. It was the Wild West. Decisions had to be made much more quickly than, than normal. We follow the money into the world of personal protective equipment, which company got the most government support. But first, there were several events in Montreal today to remember the victims of the L'Ecole Polytechnique shooting. This morning, a wreath-laying ceremony scaled down because of COVID-19. On December 6, 1989, the lives of 14 women, many of them engineering students, were cut short. The attack motivated by the gunman's hatred of feminists. That I have the profound conviction that 
those 14 women are still with us, alive in a way. They are alive in me. This evening, 14 columns of light representing the women were beamed from a lookout on Mount Royal. The day has also become a call for action on gun control and to end gender-based violence. We'll be right back. For eight months, as Canadians dealt first with the shock, then the relentlessness of the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal government tried to shore them up financially. CBC News calculates the government spent $240 billion from mid-March until the end of November. Among the goals cover Canadians' lost wages, help keep businesses afloat, and buy up PPE. A CBC News investigation, the big spend is tracking that money. It found $118 billion went to businesses, nonprofits, and charities, including hundreds of publicly traded companies. As Ashley Burke explains, of those, Air Canada appears to have received the most support by far in wage subsidies. It's one of the biggest companies in Canada and one of the industry's hardest hit by COVID-19. Revenues down up to 95%, dozens of domestic routes canceled, and more than half of Air Canada's workforce let go. It's uh, turned into much longer term um, than what a lot of people thought it would be. So it's definitely, <clears throat> pardon me, somber out there. While the industry's facing a historic low, Air Canada's tapped into the highest amount of government aid. A CBC investigation found Air Canada reported receiving $492 million to pay employees through the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy over nine months. That's four times higher than Imperial Oil, auto parts manufacturer Linmar, and Air Transat. All disclosed to shareholders, they receive more than $100 million each to cover their payroll. Air Canada says that's because at the onset of the pandemic, it employed more than other private companies, about 40,000 people, and its industry was hit disproportionately hard. Despite receiving almost half a billion dollars, Air Canada is in talks with the government for more financial support. Air Canada does have cash. This former Air Canada executive argues the airline is playing hardball with the government and using customer refunds for flights cancelled during COVID-19 as leverage. A uh, bit, bit of a shell game that's going on between Air Canada and the Canadian government that they're insisting that those refunds will only be processed if the Canadian government through the Canadian taxpayer is providing the funds for those refunds. Not a good thing. But Canada's transport minister said he's made it very clear. Uh, until they commit in writing to uh, refund passengers, uh, they will not get a cent from the Canadian government. Passengers like Calvin Hill, living in his daughter's basement. He and his wife say they're out about $4,000 for Air Canada flights they never took. They're holding us as people uh, with outstanding vouchers or refunds hostage. In a statement, Air Canada says it has paid out $1.2 billion to customers with refundable tickets. But as for the rest, the airline isn't saying if or when the others will be refunded. Meanwhile, it is offering vouchers without an expiry date. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Right from the start of the pandemic, personal protective equipment, or PPE, was in high demand across the country. CBC News found the federal government spent at least $6 billion buying it, but who were they buying it from? Aaron Salzman follows the money. You can win the weight loss battle with the Skinny Plate. The Skinny Plate, a plastic dish designed to help limit portion sizes. The person behind this product also owns the company that landed the single largest government contract to supply personal protective equipment. ProLine Advantage had no experience with PPE procurement prior to the pandemic, but it got $371 million, mainly to supply medical gowns to Health Canada. Looking great starts with your plate. And basically Businessman Mike Caron owns ProLine Advantage. Company headquarters is a home in suburban Ottawa. In a statement to CBC News, Caron says his company is experienced in supply chain management and was able to quickly pivot our business and leverage our international sourcing expertise to answer the government's call. The contract has been filled and the government is happy with the outcome. Others also answered that call. The second largest contract went to a company headquartered in a house in Calgary. $300 million to Move Factor Limited, another company with seemingly no experience in PPE. 
There's been a lot of opportunistic uh, organizations, distributors that uh, don't have any experience uh, in procuring uh, healthcare PPE and equipment uh, that uh, have kind of popped up. Not surprising, say some, given the urgent need for PPE at the start of the pandemic. This is uh, akin to a war footing here, given the severity of the event. Edmonton's PrimeMed Medical Products has been in the PPE business for 25 years. There were literally tens of thousands of new entrants into our market. CEO David Welsh says the government did a good job securing enormous amounts of PPE. At the same time... It was the Wild West. Decisions had to be made much more quickly than, than normal, and uh, the level of due diligence had to be, be shortened. And then what do you do next? You just pull it off. The pandemic leading to some extraordinary business opportunities for some brand new players in the market. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. We'll have much more for you in the coming days on The Big Spend, and you can also find more on our website, including a detailed breakdown of which programs got how much of that $240 billion in spending. It's all at cbc.ca slash news. Every affected community faces its own challenges with COVID-19. Tonight's pandemic diary comes from Newfoundland, where Marika Gao, with a business that relies on tourism, has words of concern, praise, and hope. My name is Marika Gao. My family owns the Artisan Inn and Twine Loft restaurant in Trinity, Newfoundland. This past year has been extremely difficult. Um, the situation changes constantly, but I have to say that Newfoundland and Labradorians really did take the time to travel around the province in July and August, which at least helped us get through this season. The thing that scares me is we've lost so much air access to the island that it's going to take years before we get that back and return to our regular number of tourists. In 2021, there's going to be more businesses open with more competition and there's going to be less financial support from the government. So it might be just as difficult to operate next year as it was this year. What gives me hope is obviously the vaccine, but this province has really shown its resilience in the past and hopefully it gets us through this too. Still ahead, how a 1930s Vancouver supper club was brought back to life during the pandemic. Welcome to the Palomar. A virtual reality experience bridging the past, present, and future. Two weeks ago, a Vancouver singer gave a live concert at a downtown supper club to an estimated 4,000 fans. But don't be alarmed. This was a COVID-safe show at a time when stages across much of the country are off limits. So, how did she do it? I sat down with Jill Barber, distanced, of course, to find out. Okay, cool. You, want, you guys want to try that again? You've heard of entertainers trying to reach their audiences online during the pandemic, but I'm pretty sure you've never seen anything quite like this. In a space usually devoted to creating movie special effects and video games, Jill Barber and her band are rehearsing for what is, to be entirely honest, a bit of an experiment. I was afraid of the technology uh, and I, I didn't have a really good handle on how it all worked. It's been a very steep learning curve this year and I feel like I've kind of, I've sort of shifted the narrative. It used to be that technology was not necessarily our friend as musicians, but now we're finding it can be a great tool to use. I spoke to Barbara this summer about how she was turning to Zoom with regular stages shut down. Had you done on, an online show before? No, I was really reticent to, uh, to do an online show. Stealing glances. The concerts from her home were simple and the interaction with audiences heartwarming. When I hear the song, give me strength that I need to leave my country and fight for our relationship. I'm so thrilled that that is the case, and um, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. She sent me home and straight to bed. But then a company called Showcap Entertainment came calling, pitching something much more ambitious. 
a live show on a virtual stage, Barber accompanied by her band, and real-time computer-generated images. Anything was possible. Showcap suggested Paris or New York. But Barber had a better idea. She'd read about the Palomar in the book Vancouver After Dark, in a building that had been torn down more than 60 years ago. And the Palomar was this this uh, legendary hot spot here in Vancouver in the 30s and the 40s, and it hosted the likes of Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday and Nat King Cole and the Mills Brothers, the Ink Spots, all these incredible uh, artists of the day. And uh, it was actually a huge part of the, the nightlife scene uh, back in the day in Vancouver. So using green screens and motion capture suits, a studio showcasing Vancouver's contemporary entertainment industry helped restore the memory of one of the city's historic venues. A. Thomas Goldberg is the creative director of the project. This kind of thing is, I think it's an, you know, it's an untapped opportunity for, for this kind of technology. You know, the ability to sort of reconstruct places and sort of eras that, that no longer exist and do it in a way that can make it accessible to a contemporary audience. And this was the result. Welcome to the Palomar. See les fleurs qui bordent les chemins. A slightly mind-bending mixture of past, present, and future. The Palomar reconstructed by computers from the few old pictures they could find and a bit of artistic license. Jill Barber singing live, her band transformed into ghostly images answering questions from the audience during the intermission. One of the questions you had, how many hours has this taken to, to come together? I don't know if there's a... Yeah, well, about a, a million. A, a million, of probably. Um, yeah. And a lot of people putting in a lot of um, time and talent. And maybe all of this providing a glimpse of performances yet to come, especially during COVID. In these times where so many events are forced to happen online, I was really pleased to create an event online that was meant to be online. It was not the next best thing. It was something that was truly a result of collaboration and, um, and coming together to, to do something creative, fun and cool and connective for our audience in these times. Barber says more than 4,000 people watched on their screens. Even for a singer who's played venues like Massey Hall, this was her biggest audience as a headliner. And for a singer who was reluctant to go from on stage to online, she may have found just the right mix. I think what we've been missing in a lot of the online shows is a little sense of magic. And I believe that this production really brought the magic. I feel like it gave the audience a sense of nostalgia, a sense that they were stepping back in time and uh, leaping into the future at the exact same time. And I think that that was a really uh, cool experience for my audience. And it was certainly a very satisfying experience from my perspective. Because I believe in you. By the way, Barbara is already planning her next extended reality concert on Valentine's Day, set in a different Canadian city in a different decade. Spoiler alert, disco music may be involved. Up next in our moment, staying festive and safe. What a group of neighbours are doing to spread some much-needed holiday cheer. This street party happened early in the pandemic. These Burlington, Ontario neighbours wanted to sing and dance and eat together, all physically distanced. But winter is coming and so they've adapted. Despite the colder temperatures and the layers, their commitment to keep up with their community, connection and holiday spirit is our moment. We call ourselves the Bridewood Music Night and once a week, we get out and listen to music and dance. We've met people that now have become very close friends just because of COVID. It's a lot of fun. It's not a lot of work. It helps warm me up, I have to tell you. It's, it means a lot to me. I honestly don't see a time when it will stop. We'll just keep going 
as we can, as best we can. It's just nice. Some people say that's what they look forward to every week. They know they're going to get out and hear some music. So. They never let Paul Rudolph join in any reindeer games. We got them singing last night. We're going to sing for the next two Saturdays. So hopefully they'll be in the spirit. Three French and two turtle doves. So that is fantastic. They get something like 35 or 40 people in those sing-alongs. And I can't help but wonder whether, first of all, any of my neighbors on my block in Vancouver watch The National. I hope you are. And if you are, we should try something like that. We may not get 35 to 40 people, but we can start small and see how it grows. That is The National for Sunday, December 6th. Good night. <laughs>